All right, hey everyone. So I'm here today with Mircea Gagoncha, a good friend of mine. And um, yeah, thanks for coming on. Yeah, my pleasure. It's so great to have him here because here's a, here's a quick anecdote. So when I was a little kid, I told him this before, but I was, you know, as a little kid, you watch tons of YouTube videos. And um, there was this one video by this amazing 13-year-old guitarist playing guitar concerto. And I saw that video and I said, I hate this guy with all my guts. Um, and little did I know... <laughs> Little did I know, years later, I would be studying in the same school with this guy on YouTube. For the record, I did not name that video. Yeah. No, thank goodness. Just in then, case you're wondering. Because then I wouldn't interview him because he'd, be, <laughs> he'd be too arrogant for me. Uh, <laughs> but, I, yeah. I've actually considered attempting to think... Uh, I've considered attempting... <laughs> I've actually considered attempting to take that video down, but then I thought, you know, it's like, it's got like 100,000 views, and none of my actual videos that I put up have that, so whoever it was, yeah. just like, I'll let you have it. Yeah. You have it. Something <laughs> about little 13-year-olds playing guitar concertos. <laughs> That's right. But I guess that leads me to the first question is, what got you into music? Was it your father or something like that? Kind of, yes. A lot of people ask me if I got into music out of my own will or if I was forced into it. And I think that my case is a, is a bit of a special one because the answer is both. Mm. So my parents, especially my dad, um, wanted me to do a little bit of everything when I was a kid. So I started doing maths and uh, physics because he was a physics and maths teacher and also learning a foreign language. I started with English when I was really little. And, um, and then uh, I, I did all of these things that they sort of made me do, right? But it was not first floor or anything, right? right? I was okay. just a kid and they told me I had to do this. And so I did that, right? And then as I grew up, um, my influence was which one of these I continued to work on. So as I grew up, I decided that instead of doing maths and physics, which by the way, I still love, um, I decided that I wanted to go with music. And so that was just me. That was no pressure at all from them. If anything, my dad was a little bit disappointed that I started going into the arts. He didn't actually tell me at the time. Uh, I found out later that he was a little bit afraid that it's hard to get work, which is true, by the way. <laughs> but then again, it's kind of hard to get work in anything these days. So um, I did take that decision by myself. That was all me. And uh, it led to where I am now. So yeah, there you have it, both. Wow, wow. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's kind of like a, something that I did because my dad is also a guitar teacher. Nice. Was a teacher. Mm -hmm. um, but how, how has music in your life led you to impact the lives of others and things like that? And Well, I mean, apart from the obvious things of like being a teacher, I've taught for a long time. Um, as a musician, you get a bit of a louder voice, um, not because you are better at speaking, but because you are often in front of a camera and in front of a mic. Yeah. And so you can affect some types of social change sometimes by that. Um, I try to go into things that really that I that I really like that I that I really care about and an example of that was recently um, this summer I received this request from this guitarist from Nigeria for uh, tips and tricks on playing certain pieces and um, it just felt so different from everything else because as a musician you know a lot of other musicians and all of us sort of want to push their own content so you get a lot of unsolicited ads and a lot of spam a lot of invites to things you don't need he can confirm you know not because he does it but because right. he's a musician too right. so he right. gets them too yeah. um and and this felt so different you know this guy was just asking for help you know trying to be better being really respectful and i yeah. i i volunteered some online lessons for him for example which he declined because they don't have a good enough connection in nigeria for him to right. yeah so he couldn't connect on skype and have a meaningful conversation with me so he asked me to record a YouTube video for him with a bunch of tips which I did and uh, that became uh, reasonably famous not really viral or anything but uh, a few people saw that and uh, in the video I was asking what guitar he was playing mm -hmm. and because it, it seemed from what I've seen of, of him playing that he was playing a converted acoustic steel string guitar um, right. terrible terrible instrument uh, right. just just not meant for what he was playing you know mm -hmm. he was putting nylon strings on a steel string guitar and like Ah, it was it was awful, right? And I asked him about that, and he confirmed that this was what uh, what he was using. And um, somebody actually uh, then came up and offered to donate a guitar for him. Uh, now that didn't work out. We had to find another donor, but uh, in the end, we did actually raise another guitar and the funds necessary to send it from from Spain, where the guitar was based. And now this guy has what might be the first professional nylon string guitar in the entirety of Nigeria. Mm. Uh, yeah. And that's just because I happened to find him. I don't even have that 
that big an audience right now online. Uh, but I'm starting to realize how much the internet can change the world for the better. And yeah. I want to be a part of that. Um, so yeah. that's the kind of thing that I would have never even thought about if I had not been a musician. And that's the, that's the kind of amazing advantage that we have in our line of work. So that's, that's another example. By the way, um, we are trying currently to send a second guitar. We already have a second guitar wow. that we're going to send to one of his students. And we're trying to raise the money for the, for the actual sending. Um, so if this video goes live early enough, uh, mm -hmm. you feel free to contact me. I'm sure there will be links down below yeah. to my things. Um, and otherwise, we're trying to organize a guitar camp in Nigeria uh, next year or in two years from now. I'm trying to reach out to um, you know social organizations, foundations, and even private companies that would be willing to sponsor this. We have a bunch of guitarists, uh, me included, obviously. Uh, I think we have seven or eight people that are willing to teach for free. Mm -hmm. um, if we can only raise the funds to get them to Nigeria safely right. and you right. know to uh, rent rooms and stuff. So yeah, yeah. Um, this is the kind of thing that you can do as a musician. Yeah, wow. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I followed the whole thing and it was it was crowdsourced, which was amazing because it wasn't just Mircha pulling all the strings. It was That's everyone. Right coming together That's and right. making this happen. And it probably is the first professional class yeah, guitar in yeah. Nigeria because you don't really... Use, no, I mean, there might be collectors that have it or there might be fairly rich people that have guitars in their homes, mm -hmm. but you can't buy classical guitars. Um, yeah. The capital doesn't even have a concert hall, the capital of mm -hmm. Nigeria, which is, right. which is crazy. You know? mm -hmm. There are concert halls in Lagos in the larger city, right. but not in the capital of Nigeria. Right. So this is... Um, I, and, you know, I kind of... I know how he feels because the guitar school in Romania, where I come from, um, started in the, I think in the 70s, which was in the middle of the Ceausescu regime, in the middle of the dictatorship. And uh, I think it started with one guy that came back from France, the one guy who managed to, wow. to get out and came, came back with a bunch of knowledge from right. France. And he sort of introduced this instrument mm -hmm. to us, you know? And I feel like we have the chance to do the same for other people right now. And uh, we have the chance to offer them, you know, an opportunity to lift themselves out of their conditions. Uh, Taiwo's dream is to at some point study in Europe and then go back and teach others. Uh, that's a long distance dream, you know, a long term dream. Mm -hmm. But uh, I'm sure that we can help make it happen. And, yeah. uh, and it's just the most amazing thing ever. When, when this works, yeah. when any of these steps worked, uh, it's just the most amazing. It gives purpose to your life, yeah. really. Yeah, when yeah. internet comes together and just causes yeah. a wave, exactly. um, dreams come true. I mean, we that's don't need right. Disney anymore. We just got the internet. That's I mean, right. Forget Disney. Um, <laughs> love you, that's Disney. Right. Um, <laughs> By the way, Disney, if you want to get a contract. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you need classical guitarists. Um, but uh, yeah, so it's, it's crazy because, so now you, you've helped this guy get guitars, but you've also done other incredible things. So you, you're a multiple time prize winner in multiple <laughs> concerts and things. But something that is really cool is that you perform for the king of Romania, who is now um, yeah, deceased. Yeah, he just passed, he away. Just he passed, passed away. away two days ago. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah so that's, that happened when I was a kid, I have to be honest with you. Uh, I think I was 11 or 12 the first time, and then I, I played for him again a second time, and I was invited to play again a third time in his private domain, um, but uh, that didn't happen. I don't remember exactly. But I was not organizing my own concerts when I was 13. I'm sorry to disappoint you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, so I, I, I think I met him three times, but I only played for him twice. Uh, mm -hmm. he, he did know who I was. Um, there's actually a photo uh, of me um, shaking his hand in the hand of his wife, mm -hmm. who also passed away a few years ago. Um, and, um, and that was amazing because he was the latest, sort of the last head of state from World War II that mm -hmm. was still alive. Right. I mean, I've read that there are other people that have technically been heads of state, but they have been contested or... I don't know. Right. Uh, so he might not be the only one, but he was one of the last uh, living heads of state from World War II, and really a, a living legend. And uh, yeah. and I'm not a, I'm not a politician, um, so I don't want to get into the politics side of things. Right. But uh, I I do um, feel like uh, he supported me, and uh, for that I'm very thankful. You know? which is not every day you get supported by by king royalty. That's you right. Know? No, not by at literally all. the last king of your country. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds so epic if we put it this way. When I was 12, I shook the hand of the last king of my country. <laughs> That's a story for your kids, man. It starts like, like the beginning of a really bad movie, like a voiceover you know, called something like The Last Samurai in the Amazon or something like that. You know? <laughs> it starts with a quote like this, in like a cave in the middle of the rainforest. I, I might be going a little bit overboard. Maybe. maybe. <laughs> but it's all good, because that's what we're here for. Um, it. In German, we see quatschen, which is like to just talk about nothing. It's, it's like, like, it's like banter. Oh, quatschen. Yeah, yeah, it's, like, it's, like, it's like banter. Yeah, kind of like it's banter. like banter. It, could, it can also mean gossip, but it's not okay. in this case. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. Um, 
<laughs> so on top of that, you know, just I'm just gonna keep pumping Mitch up and like the hype for you guys is what what was crazy was before I got here, I think, or maybe even when I was already here, mm -hmm. you were actually pursuing two degrees at the same time. That's right. Yeah. Which is crazy. In yeah. Düsseldorf at the Robert Schumann Hochschule, which is where we both go, or That's right. went. I, I finished, yeah. Finished. And then he was at Royal Academy of Music in London. That's right. Yeah. Which is crazy. <laughs> so how was that like, you know, traveling between two countries, pursuing these degrees? Well, um, it's actually not as hard as you'd expect. <laughs> oh, he's being <laughs> Because at this, no, but at this level, um, when you do masters, you don't have a lot of regularly occurring, occurring lessons. And so right. you have like your main instrument lessons, guitar lessons for, for me, uh, and then you have a couple of other things that you need to be at. But it's a lot of self-practice, you know, a lot of practicing by yourself or playing projects and concerts, you know. Uh, it's really sort of uh, learning and research-based in, in, at this stage, you know. And right. when you do your bachelor, you have regularly music theory and music history, music college and whatever, and you need to be there every week to do this thing, right? Right. But that's not the case in masters. So um, if you think about the workload that a regular student has, I mean, with the things that I do, with all the projects that I do, I work a lot more than that anyway, in addition to you know, mm -hmm. the, the workload that they expect. So basically, if you can manage to align what they expect from you from, uh, with your other projects that you would already do anyway, you don't really have a lot of extra work. You know? okay. um, the only hard part about it was that you had to travel a lot. Um, I like travel, that's not a problem for me. Uh, and I could only do this because the places were less than 500 kilometers away. Did you know that in Düsseldorf are actually closer to London and to Berlin? Well, we are technically we're the same, right? Uh, right. On on the map, uh, in like a straight line, right. it's five hundred two kilometers to London from the middle of Düsseldorf, and five hundred five kilometers to Berlin. So it's the same, but wow. still, wow. yeah. So it's only because it's a very very short flight, and then I found a lot of really cheap flights. Um, so I would actually fly for fifty minutes, which means that uh, leaving from Düsseldorf and landing in London, you'd actually get there before you depart, because there's one hour time difference. Right. And so I don't think they do that anymore because, I don't know, because they changed, but I have a bunch of plane tickets that say departure 7.40, arrival 7.35 on the same day. Right. You know? And that's, that's funny. It's um, pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But also, I'm going to be totally honest with you, um, it's also cheaper. It was literally cheaper for me to commute yeah. from Dusseldorf yeah. than to live in London. Yeah. London is insane. Like, it's becoming inhumane to live there, mm. especially if you want to live anywhere central. You know? Yeah. Um, I love London, and maybe if things had gone differently, I'd be living there now. Um, but I love Germany as well, and uh, it's just so much. You can you can do so much more in Germany because you have so much more money because mm -hmm. you don't have to pay for a rent like a thousand pounds for one room. I'm not even exaggerating. Like, right. That's a little steep, but yeah. that's, that's something that people pay regularly. You know, it's London. It's yeah, London. yeah. So um, it was hard. It was a challenge, mm -hmm. but I'm extremely glad that I've that I've done it. I would not do it again right now. Um, if you feel like doing it, do it. I know that there is at least one person that has done three degrees at the same time, and I know of at least one person that started four degrees but didn't finish one of them. Um, so this is not this is not really a race. We're not doing it. We don't really need the papers. I wanted the knowledge. You know, in music it depends a lot on what your teacher knows how to teach. Right. And you know, when I came to Düsseldorf to study with Joaquin Clerch, he's he's amazing. He's a big genius in yeah. the in the music world. And I definitely felt like after my first four years with him, I still had a lot to learn from him. Yeah. Um, so I didn't want to let him go. But then the academy has a lot of really great teachers as well. And so I was just hungry for the knowledge and. This opportunity came by and managed to make it work. Uh, I ended up um, I ended up leaving for short periods of time. Uh, the longest that I've been there was one month without a break, mm -hmm. and the shortest sometimes I would come back on the same day. But usually, most of the times I would be uh, there for one to two weeks, either staying with friends, couch surfing, staying in hostels, right. and at the end staying in cheap hotels because I couldn't I couldn't yeah. take the hostels anymore. Yeah. I love hostels, but after three years, it's. Um, you need a, a space to sleep without hearing snores, you know, of other random people and smelling feet. But still, it's, yeah. it's nice. It was an amazing experience, and uh, and uh, like I said, I wouldn't do it again right now. Mm -hmm. But uh, it made me who I am. It's part of what brought me where I am right now. Yeah, I mean, if you yeah. get to sit down with this guy and listen to some of the stories he's been through, <laughs> like you, you think he wasn't in London. You think he was in another country. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, which which is great because you love the world. You really That's love how right. everything comes together. That's right. And you're a, a big language fan. And Absolutely. so which languages do you speak? Uh, well, it depends on how you count, but mm -hmm. I speak okay. at a really, really good near native level. I, I do Romanian, English, German, Spanish, and Italian. 
basically in this in this order, mm -hmm. right? Uh, well, Romanian, English, German, Spanish, I can pass for a native speaker. Mm -hmm. um, you might hear some weird accent inflections here right. and there, but I can generally pass for a native speaker. Italian, I used to speak it better than Spanish before, but I, I fell out of practice. Um, yeah. So I'm, I'm not great with Italian grammar, but if, if I don't happen to make any of these grammar mistakes, I can also pass for an Italian speaker, because okay. um, I have a very good accent in Italy, in Italian. Mm -hmm. And then I learned French in school. Um, I don't speak it very well, but I do speak it a little bit. Um, I learned Portuguese by myself because I liked it, and I have friends from Brazil, by the way. I, I find it easier to speak Brazilian Portuguese than European Portuguese, but I'd like to learn European Portuguese as well. Yeah. So, yeah. And I've taught myself how to read Dutch, um, so I can understand it when it's written, I can understand some of it when it's spoken, and I can say a few basic things, but I can't, I can't really speak it. So depending on how you count, it's anywhere from five to eight languages. Um, I also, I can read Russian and Greek um, alphabets. Mm -hmm. I can uh, read a little bit of the Hebrew alphabet, but that's not very helpful because you need to know the vowels in the middle, which you can't really know if you don't speak the language. Uh, but I'm just a big language nerd, so I know this. And uh, in addition to that, I know a lot of really, really, really useless facts about languages. Mm -hmm. So I often get into random arguments with people because I just can't shut up when I hear people spewing <laughs> inaccurate information about <laughs> languages, and there's a lot of inaccurate information about information about languages out there in the world. Mm -hmm. So, like for example, when he told me that he spoke Indonesian, I immediately knew Bahasa Indonesia is the main the main language. Uh -huh. I know it has a very simple phonology, uh, not a lot of sound. Yeah. Uh, that the grammar is relatively straightforward as well, yeah. uh, that it, it got simplified because of influences from different languages. And I, I know I can go on for like 10 minutes about his language without actually speaking a word of it, because I don't speak. What word should I learn in Indonesian? What word should you learn? If there's one word that I need to learn. <laughs> I would say makan, which means eat. What's that? Makan. Makan. Yeah. Makan. Makan. Oh, and I know that orangutan comes from. Yes, yeah, so that's does. right. It means yeah, like the person of the forest. Or yeah. Something. You see? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Orangutan. So I know that kind of things, with, although they are useless for my life. But right. yeah. Hey, it, it it makes for good conversation, and that's, that's what right. you know. I'm about. You know, you guys know that. That's number one thing is I love talking to people. I love that's right. Uh, culture, empathy, and all of those things. Mm -hmm. Um, it's so important yeah. to not just be in the world and kind of breathing and wasting oxygen, but That's to actually right. contribute, which That's is right. what you've been doing, um, Thanks, which man. is really great. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> if you could broadcast one message to, um, I guess, well, I should have I should have started with, like, why classical guitar, I guess. Why classical guitar? Yeah. I just like, liked it. <laughs> no, no, well, not, 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 like, why do you play it, but, like, if someone, if you were to convince someone, like, mm -hmm. why classical guitar, like, why does it matter? Nobody listens to it. So I think I've told you, my friend says that classical guitar um, is the, so guitar, so I play the world's l most popular instrument, but least popular genre. Yeah, that's, that's absolutely and it's true. Just true. So how would you come up to someone and be like, you need to listen to classical guitar? What about it? Um, I think that I would try to tell a story. So that's what I do in my concerts as well. My concerts are all about storytelling. Um, I think if you just play the piece, they might not be familiar with the musical language. They might not be familiar with um, the way classical music works. They might be wondering where the beat is or something right, like that. Right. But, if you, but if you start with a story and you tell them about the context of the piece and the context of the composer, um, you draw them in with that, they, they will then try to fit that story onto your playing mm -hmm. and become an active participant. They okay. won't be passive in listening, but they would actively try to engage with your music. Because I think, you know, we, all, we always get asked, what is classical music? You know, yeah. I think it's basically music that tells a story in the end. You, you can say that any music tells a story. Uh, but music that has the specific purpose mm -hmm. um, to tell a story uh, and to be interesting and engaging, you know, to, to a person. It's not necessarily supposed to be danced or supposed to be listened to as background music. Mm -hmm. It's supposed to captivate your attention and, and tell you, take your places, right? Or at least that, that, that's what it is for me. So I would say, start by telling a story about the piece, about the composer, about the music, um, then, play the, then play the piece. See how they react, yeah. do the same, and then tell stories about every piece. I'm actually planning the release of a YouTube channel where I play pieces and I talk about them before so that yeah. they can be accessible to people who don't uh, listen to classical music regularly. Yeah. Um, and I really think that that's the main, that's the main thing, I think. Yeah. I, I agree, because I think, 
I've been to so many concerts where you just, mm. you, you know, even though I'm a classical musician, it's so bored. bored. Yeah, you no, fall asleep and you don't want to because mm-hmm. that's so totally disrespectful. Don't don't fall asleep at classical concerts, but I don't blame you because yeah. they don't tell you anything. You're yeah. kind of, it's like being invited, uh, like. Sorry, no, being with a bunch of friends. And mm-hmm. they have an inside joke, but they won't tell you what it is. What exactly. It means. Yeah. That's exactly yeah. what So I'm all fine with the nerdiness of classical music. Yeah. I think n- nerd culture is great, right? And music has its own type of nerd culture mm-hmm. in, in classical Very music. Very much so. But it com- there comes to a point where it becomes arrogant, where you see these people act like stars on stage and not tell a word to the audience, not try to connect at all, not make any attempt to you know, be part of th- their audience's lives, mm-hmm. you know? And um, that's why I don't fit in the classical guitar world, because yeah. that's not who I am at all. And I have no interest in being a snob, you know, who's admired on stage mm-hmm. and, you know, worshipped uh, by, uh, by, by a bunch of people in an audience. Right. So I, I think that the format in which classical music is presented <clears throat> is, very, is, very, is very wrong, usually. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm not a big fan of the whole lights go down and nobody makes a noise, you know? It can be great for certain things, uh, especially for a shorter period of time, but um, I think that in general, it's not something that makes me feel well, you know? And, um, <clears throat> and I know that music is not just supposed to make you feel well, obviously, right. it's supposed to make you feel things, not necessarily, you know, pleasurable things, mm-hmm. um, but, um, but it's not a situation that I, that I really feel comfortable in. So, yeah, uh, yeah. so I like to organize my concerts a little bit differently, and I think that you can do that with any, um, any time you present classical music who don't, to people who don't know classical music. So. Right, right. Also, I'm not sure if I'm, ever gonna, if I'm forever going to keep the uh, label, you know, classical guitar. Yeah. It comes attached with a lot of baggage. You it know? does. I prefer to play classical music, and not to lie about it, but to play cl- classic, classical music and just call it music, you know? Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, I don't know. Maybe, maybe that's just a phase. Maybe I'll grow out of it or anything. But, yeah. I don't know. I don't yeah. know. We'll see. We'll see. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, the, uh, the other question I have is, if you were to broadcast the message, I mean, this could be to the world or to classical mm-hmm. guitar. I think you just said what you would broadcast. Yeah. But what would you broadcast to the world then? If just, just be nice to each other. It's such man, a cliche, man. but it's so important. Just be nice to people. I've never heard that before. Isn't he great? Isn't it wonderful? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's no, no, but it's cliche. No, but, but it's true. It's true. <laughs> I don't think that there is. A, you know, life is short. Let's not make it harder than it is. Just be no. nice to everybody and respectful and. Uh, I don't know. That's. I mean, yeah. It's just that. It's just yeah. that. Just you know, when you do a lot of inter- internet things, you're gonna you're gonna have a lot of internet uh, people in your life. Mm-hmm. And um, I don't know if you're familiar with the work of the Vlog Brothers on YouTube. Uh, yeah. And they have this phrase DFTBA, which is "Don't forget to be awesome." Mm-hmm. Um, and they actually call their merch company "Don't forget to be awesome." Mm-hmm. Um, and I absolutely love it. It's uh, basically a, a more hip way of presenting what I said. Just, just right. be nice to one another. Right. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> peace and love, people. Peace and love. Peace and love. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, where can people find you online? Um, only on any social media. Uh-huh. Um, so Facebook, YouTube. Uh, well, Facebook, Snapchat. Um, Instagram, um, what else? Uh, Twitter, of course. I have really few followers on Twitter because nobody in Germany uses Twitter. Mm. You're like one of three people I know in Germany that, that uses it. I don't even use it, I just have No? One. Okay, you see? <laughs> you see? <laughs> and you've lived in Germany, yeah. that's why. <laughs> it's like a German virus that comes up and pr- prohibits you from using Twitter. Okay. Anyway, um, so on all of these and on YouTube, I'm actually currently planning the launch of two channels. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm not quite sure how I'm going to package them. Maybe I'm going to package them in one channel, but I think it's probably going to end up being two channels. Um, on YouTube, uh, one that is based on storytelling and guitar uh, playing, mm-hmm. and another one that is based on like mus- musician lifestyle and travel. Yeah. And um, yeah, because we travel a lot, and I think it's nice to share that. I've actually just been working on editing one of my one of my vlog episodes. Mm-hmm. So stay tuned for that. And. Yeah. Um, and in the meantime, follow me on social media. And you can go to my website as well, but who goes to, who goes to a website mm-hmm. these days? Uh, social media is basically your website. Yeah, yeah. Days. yeah. So you can find them everywhere. Mitchell Gogoncha, 13-year-old, incredible, awesome, <laughs> <Shut> amazing. <up. laughs> <laughs> but awesome. Thank you so much for watching. So glad that you joined us. And uh, we look forward to more things and hearing from Mitchell himself. Absolutely. Awesome. Yeah. So, and see you next time. Yep. Bye. Bye. <laughs>